we, we keep talking a lot about this, you know, significant moment, obviously, uh, in, visually in, and in terms of the public visual record vis-a-vis -vis the war, and then have sort of gestured toward after the war. And now, uh, now we have, we're going to have a brief uh, consideration, indeed, of that. So, Sarah. Yeah, but so, um, so we were thinking about, uh, I guess our, our theme is the you know, Civil War and the role of visual culture in shaping Civil War memory. Um, in the later 19th century, and I realized when I was thinking, oh, I got to do this PowerPoint, I don't know a whole lot about it when it comes to, you know, sort of high art painting. Um, so this is kind of a sketch, and I think it's a very, very interesting area for consideration. Um, <clears throat> so I was just going to do this kind of flyby of some images, and I'm thinking of uh, some interesting contrast. This is, I think, a Homer painting that is as affecting, if not more so, than um, veteran in a new field. It's a tiny little painting, and, and it, it's so interesting that Cindy showed that the um, you know um, monument of the contemplative soldier by um, was it um, Miller? Millmore. 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 Um, this actually precedes it, and uh, as you can see, it, it's a very simple painting showing the same subject: the soldier contemplating the grave. So so this is all about memory, and. Uh, there are crosses in the background. He, his jacket is open and shows just like this black gaping nothingness. And, and so it suggests you know, real deep mourning and, and melancholy and, and remembrance. So was this going to be how the war was remembered in visual culture? It's interesting, I think, to um, also consider Eastman Johnson's pension claim agent of 1867, it was shown at the National Academy of Design, and um, as you can see, it represents a legless, you know, an amputee <clears throat> from the war who is being interviewed by the government agent who has a big trunk full of papers. You know, it's like this whole red tape thing going on, and uh, you know, he's he's trying to make sure that the government will will repay him in the form of a pension, but. Like Homer's veteran in a, new, in a new field, he's returned to the family homestead. It's a New England scene, and his whole family is around him. Um, interestingly, uh, one of the critics writing about this painting in 1867, Russell Sturgis, said that um, he, he saw it as um, at once a memorial of the war end of New England domestic life. So, so I think the painting and the, that critique in particular set up what I see happening in art. That is um, a memor memorial to the war and to New England domestic life. But what I see happening just in the few paintings that I pulled together for the 18, late 1860s and 70s is it becomes much more about nostalgia, a memorial of domestic life, especially New England pastoral life. And I think that, you know, this kind of goes along with what Pat Hills talks about in her essay on Eastman Johnson. There's this little window when um, it's possible still, there's still interest in, in edgy paintings, you know, paintings that deal with slavery, with the aftermath of the war. But more and more, there seems to be a drift, especially in the 1870s, toward something that's more touchy-feely, you know, sort of old New England before mechanization and, and such related themes. So I, I think it's very interesting to compare it with the Homer painting, which is so severe and stark and kind of uncompromising. Um, and Johnson is all about, you know, it's kind of mushy, really. Um, and, you know, kind of touchy-feely, and it pulls your heartstrings in a way that Homer's painting refuses to do. So another compare and contrast that I thought was kind of instructive and suggestive of these, you know, these two ways that visual commemoration could go. You either forget it or you, you address it. In a metaphorical form, in these two examples, the George Innes Peace and Plenty pretty much speaks for itself, I think. Um, painted right after the war. It's a huge painting. It's in the Metropolitan Museum. We didn't see it that day because uh, we ran out of time. Um, but it's an abundant, you know, golden, beautiful, 
harvest scene. And this is quite different also from Homer's veteran in a new field, which is also about a harvest, but a very complex and very ambiguous one indeed. Whereas here, you know, it's like, where's the trauma? You know, we're all back at the, in the farm, you know, everything is great. Um, we won and, and the future is, is golden. Compared to Sanford Gifford's painting, Sanford Gifford um, was actually in the war. There are these wonderful paint, uh, photographs of him. He was a really handsome guy, kind of looked dark and brooding, and uh, uh, photographs of him in his uniform. He was a friend of Winslow Homer, and in fact, um, again, all my notes are in Seattle, so um, I don't have them all in my head, but I believe he gave it to, to Gifford as a, as a gift, you know, the soldier contemplating the grave. Um, and this is Gifford's Twilight Hunter Mountain, painted in 1865. Um, it's a scene of um, a cleared forest in this little bowl of valley in Hunter Mountain. The sun is setting. Um, and, and I think that you know, all those shattered trees in the foreground evoke a battlefield. You know, it's like um, a kind of metaphorical way of speaking about death, about you know, mourning after the war. And I think um, Homer's 1860-1870 double-page spread from Harper's Weekly really tells us a lot of interesting things about this, this whole, uh, you know, the war and its aftermath. What was it going to be? Um, this is much more uh, sort of happy face than veteran in a new field or soldier contemplating a grave. Um, there, there are so many interesting things going on. Uh, Peter Wood talked about it a little bit, but can you hear me if I just step out here? Oh, good. Um, so there's Lincoln up there, but there's another interesting thing. You see those long streamers of paper? That's red tape. So he's <laughs> talking about you know, the government bureaucracy and you know, those complexities of the war. Um, soldiers leaving, you know, sort of launching into a charge in the top left. There's a monitor up in the top left. Um, there's cannonading going on in the bottom left, you can see there's that southern palm tree, you know, just sort of marking the spot. And here are some politicians bloviating. Um, and here, of course, is 1870, the new year, it's a baby, you know, everything is going to begin again. Um, and up in the top right, there's still war, you know, soldiers firing, kind of firing squad. But then, here's the vision of what's going to happen. Uh, and remember, this is this is Harper's Weekly, so you know, Homer is going to be a lot less you know, kind of severe than he might be in a painting. So, but this is one of the most interesting little details. Here's here's the old year, you know, the Grim Reaper, um, and he's got his his scythe, just like the veteran in the field, and he's knocking 1869 off his bicycle. It's a very weird <laughs> figure. And then right next to it, there are veterans reaping with their sides. So you know, if you think that there's something you know too much of a stretch about the Grim Reaper and better than the new field, you know, here here it is. Yeah. Gosh, you know, how could it be more overt? And then this wonderful scene of a school teacher uh, who is teaching both black and white children. And here's Grant and Colfax, a little campaign sort of sign on the blackboard. Um, so what's going to happen, though, is uh, people, or at least high art audiences, seem to really prefer New England nostalgia to reminiscing about the war. And both of these paintings date from 1871. Eastman Johnson's old stagecoach, which shows children in Nantucket frolicking, um, frolicking on the you know, sort of um, ruined frame of an old stagecoach, which uh, coincidentally enough, has the name inscribed on a Mayflower. Mm. So there's this sense of you know, the new generation, you know, playing in the old coach. They're going to somehow reconstitute the nation, um, and uh, you know, some some of the children being the horses, and interestingly enough, a couple of them are black. They don't get to be in the coach um, with the little ladies and gentlemen. Um, but this game was an enormous hit at the National Academy in 1871. Critics could not say enough about it. They gushed and you know, they adored 
and they babbled, and you know, it was like, oh, it brings us back to our childhood. <laughs> and you know, everyone can identify that with this as if they all grew up in Nantucket. <laughs> and there's this, you know, this, this um, ir irresistible seduction of nostalgia that really dominates uh, quite a lot of genre painting and, and landscape painting in the 18th. 70s, whereas you know, Homer is going back to the war, rainy day in camp, this is a scene of Yorkshire, and um, Homer signed his name on one of these barrels, also with the cloverleaf emblem of the regiment, um, to which he was assigned. Uh, it's not a battle scene, it's a camp scene, he's showing you know, this kind of boring <coughs> and tedium and discomfort of the war. Um, the mule over here, I think it's branded United States, um, but I didn't have a chance to look at a good detail. It does have some kind of significant brand on it. And uh, one critic, people, you know, there wasn't a lot of notice on this painting, but one critic said that the mule, the rain-soaked mule you're looking so miserable, told the whole story of the war. Um, so the story of the war is in this wretched animal. And it su suggests to me, you know, again, this desire to to go back to old times and, and forget the war. Where did uh, Homer's crack the whip painting come in relation to these? Well, in my, um, in my view, uh, Homer's crack the whip is, is an answer to Johnson um, because he painted it the next year and he wanted to capitalize on that as well. Um, in fact, I wrote a whole essay about, I wrote a whole essay in a catalog about the you know, sort of rivalry between Johnson and Homer. Um, and, um, you know, I think that Homer wanted to, you know, he wanted to get on the stagecoach, too, um, and have it his own hit. So then what do we have in the year of the centennial? You know, we have Enoch Wood Perry, who's a friend of Homer's. They went painting together on Long Island and other places. What is he painting? You know, a quilting party. Um, no sewing machines, you know, it's not urban at all, it's like this rustic scene, you know, younger woman learning the craft of quilting, and uh, here's a classic old bitty, you know, related to the, you know, the uh, discussion we were having the other day about um, the caricatures of, you know, sort of Lincoln and Seward wearing ladies' clothes. Uh, so, so this is the year of the centennial, going back to old times. Now, um, I think what happens later, you see both in painting and illustration, but again, this is kind of almost terra incognita for me, but I think, you know, I saw a pattern um, where the longer, you know, the distance between the war and the present, the, you know, the greater the possibilities for going back to it and, and creating a story. So um, this was one of the big publications of the middle of the 1880s, uh, Battles and Leaders of the Civil War, mm -hmm. a multi-volume work uh, which, um, in which various chapters were uh, first published in Century Illustrated Magazine, which was one of the highbrow, you know, sort of really intellectual um, New York outlets. Um, it was written by Robert Underwood Johnson and Clarence Buell. And uh, the volumes appeared um, in 1887. Numerous artists illustrated these volumes. Um, Alfred Wallow, uh, there were actually some illustrations by Winslow Homer, and various others who had been in the war, been sketch artists. And they run the gamut from you know, pictures of steamships, you know, these steamers landing a few days after Shiloh in Pittsburgh, to you know, sort of heart stringy illustrations like this one, which called, is called Looking for a Friend. It's in the battles and leaders, but also in the pictures, these um, references to individual experience. Um, at the same time, you know, there was a lot of battle painting, and a great deal of this seems to have gone into state houses and various other public sort of sites. So um, Julian Scott, who was actually at the age of 15, he was a Vermont painter, or he was a New Englander. At the age of 15, he was a fighter in the Civil War, and uh, he was wounded and discharged. Then he studied at the National Academy of Design, and um, he was commissioned by the state of Vermont to paint this humongous um, battle scene 
the Battle of Cedar Creek, which was in Virginia, and this is the Vermont regiments, you know, sort of being heroic and you know, sort of whooping the Southerners. Um, it's, it's a huge painting, it's 20 by 24 feet. And so this is where you see battle painting. I, it's, what I think happened, you know, a lot of painters are painting the war in various ways, but they just didn't get into the, into the canon. They kind of faded out of history, I think, because it just wasn't studied. The uh, art historians, Americans were much more interested in, in what was happening in, in sort of painting that was modern and was keeping up with you know, sort of the cosmopolitan trends. And you see a lot of uh, Civil War themes and illustration. Here, Gilbert Gall, um, who was also a Civil War artist, I think, publishing this um, last letter. This is a Confederate soldier who's dead, and he's clutching the last letter from home. Uh, this, is in, this is in Century. It's a New York magazine, and I think it really speaks to this desire to you know, sort of reconcile and kind of soften the memory of the war. Um, there was a, a gooey poem that uh, this illustration actually was uh, accompanied by. And um, then I think, to me, one of the most fascinating paintings, that, uh, this is all about the lost cause. And um, sunset after Appomattox, so everyone can see you know, who the subject is. General Lee, he's just sort of slumped, slumped on this log. Traveler, his horse is looking at him, you know, in sympathy. And, uh, you know, he's sort of thinking about this lost cause. Um, everything is lost. And what's, you know, just totally weird to me is um, that this was painted by a Swiss born symbolist artist. <laughs> born in Switzerland, his parents moved to Cincinnati when he was young. Uh, he studied in Paris, and, but also in Memphis, Tennessee, and he moved back to Memphis in 1873. Now, this was commissioned by the state of Tennessee for a planned uh, uh, memorial, uh, Confederate Memorial Hall, uh, which was not built, um, but the painting was exhibited at the um, Tennessee Centennial in 1897. So, so there's painting, there's a, there's a body of painting in the South, I think, that, that could still be well repaid study that is you know, dedicated to the lost cause. Uh, Guterres actually did several other really interesting Civil War themed paintings around this time that were sympathetic um, to the Confederate cause and Confederate heroism. So, so you know, it goes, as I see it, in this totally sketchy way from um, you know, the sort of New England nostalgia to the reconciliation and, you know, finally this lost cause monumental painting. Um, and I think, you know, on the basis of the, my desperate attempt to pull something together, um, <laughs> that this is something that really well deserves more research and study. Right, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, breathlessly. Um, this is a, uh, a portrait of Hiram R. Revels, the, uh, um, which was um, distributed in 1870. Uh, it's a chromolithograph published by Louis Prang based on a painting by Theodore Kaufman, of whose paintings we, we have seen. It was in itself based on a photograph. Um, uh, What's particularly interesting about this is perhaps less the, the, the lithograph uh, than, of course, the sort of story behind it. Because uh, Louis Prang, which was one of the largest chromolithograph uh, outfits uh, in Boston, pretty much decided that, you know, there's a market now uh, for images of African-American statesmen and both a market in uh, generally nationally, but also, in fact, in the African-American community. So as uh, is always the case in these things, he sent, uh, he went, needed some blurbs. Uh, and he sent, uh, he requested one from Frederick Douglass and Frederick Douglass perhaps sent one of the greatest blurbs as far as I'm concerned. And, um, although I don't know if it actually 
we don't have any record of it uh, having actually gone with the product or you know any of the advertisements or anything. But the point here is that Douglas, when he received the uh, the print in June 1870, wrote back to Prang saying, "It strikes me as a faithful representation of the man, that is Hiram Revels. Whatever may be the prejudices of those who may look upon it, they will be compelled to admit that the Mississippi senator is a man." and one who will easily pass for a man among men. <clears throat> we colored men so often see ourselves described and painted as monkeys that we think it's, great, it's a great piece of good fortune to find an exception to this general rule. Now, he went on to say that perhaps black Americans could now benefit from the virtues of pictures already enjoyed by white citizens. Uh, Douglas, this is another part of his, I guess it's more than a blurb, heretofore, Colored Americans have thought little of adorning their parlors with pictures. They have had to do with the stern, and I may say the ugly realities of life. Pictures come not with slavery and oppression and destitution, but with liberty, fair play, leisure, and refinement. These conditions are now possible to colored American citizens, and I think the walls of their houses will soon begin to bear evidences of their altered relations to the people about them. And he conclude, concluded by saying, this portrait is a historical picture. It marks with almost startling emphasis the point dividing our new f from our old condition. Well, you know, it's both a, it's also a poignant quote because uh, indeed, as, as you know, we've been discussing, uh, it, it both marked uh, an opportunity and then uh, a, a, I guess you could say a betrayal. But, uh, it, to to complement uh, Sarah's presentation, I wanted to to you know very very briefly sort of consider uh, Douglas's statement vis-a-vis -vis the notion that now Black Americans had things to put on their walls, and for a period of time at least, uh, keeping in mind that this is always <coughs> this. Um, I guess you could say new intervention, uh, popular pictorial intervention is always bapping up against racist images, uh, you know, picturesque images, uh, the sort of, you know, the, 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 the traditions of antebellum and, and nostalgia about uh, the Southern past. There is still a remarkable change that, that takes place for a period of time. Such that, for example, um, this image, which was in Harper's Weekly in, in July 20. Uh, 25th, 1868, called election, Electioneering at the South, um, which is particularly interesting because it was done by an artist named William Ludwell Shepard, who was a Confederate officer during the war and is probably responsible uh, when you look at a lot of illustration, certainly for the, the 20 years to 30 years following the Civil War, nostalgic, goopy, uh, if not, you know, just downright insulting images of slavery. Yet at certain times he was sent on an assignment, and this may be an indication, by the way, we don't know what the original sketch looked like, where somewhere in between the sketch and the published image, that is the engraving, something happened. But, you know, this is a, 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 a powerful image of election campaigning in the, in the black community. Um, in a similar fashion, uh, there was, of course, a lot of images um, of education, as Sarah had pointed out in the corner of Winslow Homer's uh, painting, uh, uh, rather uh, engraving, uh, that, that compendium engraving. Uh, there was a lot of coverage, particularly in the first few years after following the Civil War, of the establishment of schools for, for African Americans. What's interesting, of course, is in many cases, if not most cases, it was with white teachers coming down the, in the South. But there were, as in this case, also coverage of schools run by African Americans. This is the Zion School for Colored Children in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, this was actually an, an Alfred, based on an Alfred Wode sketch published in Harper's Weekly in December, on December 15, 1866. But what both this was representing and then the accompanying uh, description also stated was the extent to which it was being run by free people. Um, then, of course, there is the now the symbolism of not the field, uh, the field slave, or for that matter, the free person working in the in, in, in groups in the field, but the uh, quintessential yeoman farmer. But now, in in the symbol of of the black um, of of the black yeoman, um, this one called Plowing in South Carolina. Uh, which was uh, published in Frank Leslie's in 1866 by a sketch by James E. Taylor. And I should say, as I've mentioned to a few folks 
in our, in our conferences, in all of these publications and, and also in a number of illustrated books, in 1866, they are sending artists, not to mention journalists, throughout the South to do tours of the South, this terra incognito that uh, is now uh, going to be explored and illustrated by, and illustrated not as a, a, a war, uh, you know, a, a locus of war, but rather now this, uh, basically the, the, re or the reunited United States and what's going on there. Many pictures, of course, quite picturesque and, and or for that matter, you know, stereotype where for all intents and purposes, African Americans are extras in, you know, landscapes, whether rural landscapes or urban landscapes, Yet there are numerous pictures like this as well. Now, this is not to say that there aren't many conflicting images and how do, in fact, do we deal with this notion about where, um, where do we, you know, when we, when we see certain images, are we seeing a, a, an immediate resurgence even on the part of publications and artists who had previously been supporting um, uh, equality uh, um, and, and uh, and racial equality, um, and not to mention uh, rights, um, or are we seeing something else? Uh, now, this is, of course, uh, Thomas Nast's colored rule in the reconstructed with a question mark behind its state in Harper's Weekly in March 14, 1874. Uh, and if you can't see, see it very, very clearly, obviously this is only, only, almost, you know, um, archetypally uh, stereotyped uh, figures, black legislators in South Carolina with, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Liberty saying at the top, admonishing the, um, uh, the, the unruly congressman, uh, black congressman, by saying, in fact, that you're, you know, think of the, the phrase here because I can't read it directly, you know, you are, you're aping lower class whites, you know, and you're shaming us. Uh, so I think there's a class component to this too, as I've raised before, but What's perhaps most interesting about this is that there's an answering cartoon to this. This is in the New York Daily Graphic within the week of the publication of this cartoon, which was called, I Wonder How Harper's Artist Likes to Be Offensively Caricatured Himself. <laughs> so, I mean, again, there's this moment in time where, they, and, and this is, I guess, the first time you saw actually Mickey Mouse in, a, in, in the form of Thomas, <laughs> Thomas Nast, so, or Mickey Rat, I guess, but, um, but the point being that there is a sort of pictorial di or debate going on at this period of time in, in, in 1874. Now, just to give Nast, you know, place this in perspective, although this, eight, this the 18, on the, on the uh, left, the 1874 image would argue, as many people said, oh, well, this indicates that Thomas Nast was disillusioned with Reconstruction. However, for example, uh, in uh, in um, 1876, there was this among many other uh, images, and, and I think Greg is going to show some more. Nast, um, uh, this is called He Wants a Change Too, and it was a direct response to the July 1876 Hamburg, South Carolina massacre of the, of the African-American community. But it's a pretty powerful image. Uh, if, if we want to talk about an image of, of agency here, this is definitely... This is definitely one, and certainly at this point in time, he was equally not uh, not disengaged. I think I've mentioned this before, and we've looked at the, the image on the right before. That is of the uh, the painting of um, uh, the freed slave, uh, the the engraving of the statue of the freed slave, which was um, uh, done by um, I can't remember his first name, but Pesicar, who's an Italian. Uh, sculptor, and of course did not appear in any of the American pavilions. It was in the Austrian pavilion in Memorial Hall. Uh, it was uh, a major focal point for, um, for freed people uh, who were basically, except for a few additional uh, 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 contributions by sculptors, I guess Ammonio Lewis also had, a, had, I think, sculpture here. Um, were basically excluded. You know, uh, there were no black workers who were allowed to work on the exposition in Philadelphia. Uh, the, the, the strongest indication of sort of, well, what was the commemoration of the Civil War? It was a Dixie restaurant where all the, all the waiters were, were black. Um, but until actually very recently, uh, this, was, uh, this is a cartoon on, on, the, right, on the sorry left uh, called um, Statue of Emancipation, 
which was in a guide, one of the many guides for the, for the uh, exposition called Going to the Centennial. Uh, as you can see, needless, it's pretty, it's, it, it's, it is a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a cruel parody, which actually captured most of the responses to the, um, to the sculpture. And I should say, this was discovered by uh, an a, a art history student here at the Graduate Center who's working on uh, his dissertation on fairs. Uh, and it was by, perhaps, uh, yeah, most interestingly, Thomas Worth, who got to be famous later for the dark town, the awful dark town uh, prints, uh, which were the most popular things, kept Courier and Ives uh, basically alive as a, as a business for a good 20 years. These were the really, really awful chromolithographs. You know, always they, had, they were two parts of really stupid, uh, stereotyped, rural African Americans doing, you know, silly things. It usually involves one where they're doing something that, that is ba way above their station, and then the second one's how they do it badly and leads to disaster in one way. But this is one of his early images. But, but in this case, this is, this is actually, and, and this engraving was unusual, because indeed among the images of the fair, it's the only image I'd ever seen before. I saw this one uh, recently of the statue itself even though it was very, very popular. Nonetheless, there are many other images of, uh, that continue to, in one way or another, show African Americans um, in, a, in a respectable fashion, and particularly uh, the exodusters. Those are, the, of course, the, the black migrants that leave the rural South in, um, it's starting in the very late 70s, uh, in a, a sort of mass migration to the West, in settlements in the West. Um, now, so for example, uh, uh, Leslie's, uh, this is a part of obviously a double page spread called The Remarkable Exodus of Negroes from Louisiana and Mississippi, Incidents of the Arrival, Support and Departure of the Refugees at St. Louis, and the top image in partic particular procession of refugees from the steamboat landing to the colored churches. Uh, and uh, it's particularly interesting to see this, uh, th these engravings in contrast to some of the textual uh, uh, accounts of uh, the migrants, which tend to emphasize uh, the desperation, which of course took place, starvation, uh, difficulties. In this case, though, and it's hard to see here, the, the images of the migrants are quite stalwart and quite respectable and playing up, and playing up, and I might add, uh, support from local black communities of, for the migrants as they're taking, as they're taking that journey. Um, and just two other things to touch on here is, and then there is, are the beginnings, the real hints of beginnings of some pictorial representation by African American artists. Um, this is Henry Jackson Lewis, who, who had been born a slave, uh, assisted, um, and I'm afraid I can't remember, the archaeologist, uh, uh, an archaeologist and pretty much self-taught uh, and, and working with uh, uncovering Indian mounds in the South, uh, did some, uh, sent in some sketches uh, that were published in Harper's Weekly and Frank Leslie's and eventually became the cartoonist for the Indianapolis Freeman. This is a, a you know, this is a self-portrait uh, that was uh, created in 1890 of him in, in the studio there. Unfortunately, he died very, very early. But uh, but uh, I, you know, he's he is then replaced by other cartoonists over time. Very, very limited cartooning. Uh, the the Indianapolis Freeman at, at at this time called itself the Harper's Weekly of the Colored Race. Um, but uh, uh, but it it is a you know it's it, it's bo it's both an inkling and it's a, and it's a and it's the beginning of what will be a tradition in a lot of the black press. Uh, you know, later in the century. And finally, uh, there, there, even after the official, of course, collapse of Reconstruction and the, and the continuing, <coughs> um, I guess you could say, declension and, 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 uh, and decline of the representation of free people, there are these still quite striking moments, in, at least in the mainstream pictorial press, where you'll see uh, you know, black figures in in uh, in um, stations of authority that 
that we that social history is certainly documented, but uh, is certainly not in the popular is not in the fine arts, and in and in fact, I would argue is rarely even in photography. Uh, I mean, this is takes places. I mean. Uh, ex some that come to mind, of course, are things like um, the Knights of Labor, uh, some of the leadership of the Knights of Labor, which were African-American. And when uh, there's, in 1886, a, uh, a national convention of the Knights of Labor, and there's an attempt to, to have segregated housing in the New York delegation, which is an integrated delegation, uh, is not allowed to uh, be housed in a hotel, and in fact protests. Uh, Terrence Powderly, who was the head of the Knights of Labor, was in one of these situations where he didn't want to alienate uh, the, the white, uh, the local white community. Nonetheless, he ended up, the convention ended up being opened by Frank Farrell, who was the black representative from New York City. And that's on the front cover of, of for example, Frank Leslie's. And that's not, that's not an isolated incident. This is interesting because this is this is published in 1889 so it's pretty late in the century and it is um, uh, it was by uh, Joseph Becker who was of course uh, the he was the art supervisor for what it's worth of Frank Leslie at the time and it's an artist's notes of a subtropical rail s journey so it's it's part of a larger two-page spread and it's a picture of a Jacksonville Florida police court of a black judge a black justice reproving a disorderly white brother and dismissing him with a fine. But the point is here is the silly looking person in this image, of course, is the drunk, the white drunk, and the respectable image is a black judge. Just at this period of time where we're heading into the nadir of the representation of African Americans uh, in, um, uh, in, in popular illustration. So uh, that's a fair, fast survey of uh, 30 years after the war. So I'm going to um, a little bit overlap with Josh, but to talk a little bit about um, the creation of something that I think is often overlooked or kind of treated in, in uh, purely instrumental or cynical terms, but that I think is um, in our rush toward the narrative of, of reunion, um, which sometimes seems even faster among scholars than it was for participants at the time, um, which is the idea of the bloody shirt. You know, the sort of most uh, significant, you know, to my mind, um, political appeal toward the North, um, which was in fact driving, at some level, you know, meant to drive a stake into the heart of, of reunion. And that at certain times could also seem to be intertwined, but not necessarily, and not always on terms that, um, you know, the, that we would see as, as equitable, um, with a sort of demonization of, uh, of the Confederacy um, can be tied with, at times, though not always, um, a new vision of African-American political process. Though, as we'll see, this gets complicated. Um, one of the things that we, you know, one of the things that immediately became a series of crises, um, so I'm gonna be mostly looking at uh, well-known political cartoons um, and, you know, trying to ask the questions about how they help us to understand a broader Northern public opinion. One of the first questions that was gonna be raised is sort of what is the South? And you see this in the images of the ruins that we've talked about. You see it in both sort of high and middle brow art. But what is the relationship of the federal government to the South? Um, and that there's a sort of basic instability in these kind of portrayals about what it is that the federal government is doing. Here you can sort of imagine what Albion Tourget, you know, sort of the novelist Albion Tourget fantasized, um, you know, that you could see the federal government come in and what, uh, what, what my friend Steve Prince is, uh, writes about the magic northern. But they come into an uncivilized area, and through you know carrying the gifts of civilization and law on the holy tablets, you know then life becomes organized in and of itself. Um, but immediately this gets pushed back from two directions. Um, and the first direction is the reports of the Freedmen's Bureau officers themselves and the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, which portrays them as sort of completely overwhelmed and outnumbered. Um, this sort of beset upon, stuck between sides that are moving in and claiming space for their own. Uh, you know, for their own will. And at the one hand, you can see the sort of, you know, effort to portray the officer's nobility, holding back these sort of, you know, ragtag confederates. On the other hand, it also has built within it a sense of his inherent futility, right? That he's not gonna be able to restrain either side. In this context, one of the most interesting things to me is how little representation, while there's a lot of representation of the Freedmen's Bureau, how little representation there is of the people around them. Um, that while there's an enormous demobilization, um, that in the fall of 1865, there's still 120,000 troops stationed in the, in the ex-Confederacy. It's 80,000 in the spring of 66. 
It remains between 15 and 20,000 for many years afterwards. And yet those are almost never portrayed. It's the sort of image of the Freedmen's Bureau, not of the army outpost, um, in part because of the deep discomfort with this notion among both, uh, you know, both Northern Democrats but also Republicans. And you also then immediately see this pushback, this opposition to the Freedmen's Bureau from the other end, um, not that it's overwhelmed by you know, this sort of un, uh, unrestrained southern, uh, white Southern society, um, but this sort of tie in to uh, President Andrew Johnson's critique of it as a sort of massive giveaway, this sort of you know, early Jesse Helms style, you know, uh, they're taking from you, they're taking from whites and giving to blacks, um, that you see immediately developed both in political argument and the popular press. Now, in thinking about how to, you know, one of the things that that we wrestle with, I think is that, you know, for a long time, scholars, you know, weren't sure when Reconstruction began, but they knew when it ended, right? And through the variety of uh, portrayals from the, you know, sort of early, you know, nationalist portrayals of the Civil War, you know, popular Civil War series, James Ford Rhodes, the early professional, Dunning School, um, the response to the Dunning School, you know, by early liberals like Kenneth you know, Stamp, um, a little less stamp than some of the others, um, the response uh, of Eric Foner. It always ended in 1876. And my smart aleck response is that today, you know, among people of the sort of, uh, you know, younger than Foner generations, um, <laughs> that any answer is okay for when Reconstruction ended except 1876. You know, that that's the sort of one wrong answer, you know, that'll get you pulled off the stage. I mean that mostly facetiously. But then in terms of, but then as people have, shifted or redefined the question of what's available, we see a different set of narratives, some of which by placing the terms, uh, you know, going back in some ways to Du Bois or Stamp and others upon land redistribution and seeing that question, have it ending amazingly quickly because it's very clear, even clearer now than it was 20 or 30 years ago, how quickly that's off the table. Others focusing upon labor reformulation and sort of goes a little longer, but they see that um, reaching certain patterns, um, you know, within years after the end of the war. Um, a brand new book that sees, defines the sort of reconstruction through the idea of an openness toward a universal brotherhood of man has that, you know, sort of obviously, you know, ending almost immediately or through bodily health. On the other hand, the other direction that scholarship has gone is to push the era much, to push the era much, much farther. And that is people have stopped focusing on presidential elections and looked at grassroots political power, um, that it's become clear that at that level, the 1880s are in fact not the decline, but the absolute peak of black local political power, the 1880s and early 1890s, picking up an older argument about why exactly was disfranchisement such a big deal, um, not to ratify something that had already been accomplished, but to create something new. Um, similarly, revisionist work upon Republicans um, at a national level has suggested that while it sort of continues to be fraught um, with sort of, this, and as we'll see, with complex you know, thoughts about what, ex what terms of equality were going to be available to African Americans, that the 1880s and even up to 1891 um, you know, don't represent the sort of uh, widespread retreat that we used to think about. But that instead, you know, the most ambitious bill that passed was passed in 1875, the Civil Rights Act of uh, Public Accommodations. 1880s, two attempts that each came within a few votes of passing, despite getting zero votes from, uh, from Democrats in the South for the Blair Education Bill. And then in 1890 to 91, this sort of crisis of uh, an effort to pass a federal regulation of local elections in the South through the Lodge Elections Bill, um, which again comes within a few votes of passing, despite not getting any votes from Democratic South. At the same time, while the Republicans have control of Congress, they investigate hundreds of elections in the South. Um, for congressional elections, not always deposing people, but building up this record of fraud. Um, and then to even more complicate it, some of the work on home land ownership suggests that while those stories all then end with disfranchisement in the 1890s, the work on land ownership has suggested that actually there's a boomlet in certain parts of the South in land ownership of, uh, among African Americans at exactly as the political disaster hits. Um, that in eastern North Carolina, that as the disfranchisement of 1898, that despite that, or you know, and somehow uh, between 1900 and 1910, because of the collapse of plantation system um, and the end of the turpentine industry, that there's actually an explosion in black small farmers. So this complexity of what it is that we imagine being opened up at the war, helping us walk through different answers of when we see when we see an ending. 
Um, the way that these immediately portray themselves is through this question of how to understand you know, the black vote. And here we get some familiar images of sort of dignity. What I think is also interesting is as people try and get at the notion not of the sort of sole individual, but trying to capture or portray you know, the art of persuasion. Um, as well as you know, the sort of immediate you know, democratic you know, first response of mocking, and here explicitly mocking it on a sort of pyramid of foolishness, right? If you're going to enfranchise African Americans, and then you're going to have to enfranchise Chinese, and this sort of walk down, uh, you know, walk down from uh, you know, sort of pyramid. Um, and then the image that, uh, that Josh talked about. There's also this contest immediately in the images of Andrew Johnson. Um, you know, somebody who, you know, sort of figures, you know, sort of quickly and, you know, in villainous terms and in, in, uh, in modern portrayals, um, but who generates, uh, you know, this amazing set of productions about kingship, um, you know, all, almost all negative, um, but you can see these portrayals that draw on him both through the sort of consistency of the Othello imagery, um, but also, you know, this, just in case you don't get the, you know, the crown doesn't help you enough, you know, I am king. Um, and this fear that was widely circulating at the time, there is him with William Seward, um, who to my mind is actually the villainous character in the, uh, you know, in the fall of Reconstruction, but um, you know, here he is with William Seward acting out his role as king. Um, but there's also this great fear that circulates um, that having militarized politics in all kinds of ways, north and south, that the ability to restrain or to bring back a sort of less militarized version of politics um, this, interestingly, as Josh, I think, knows better than I do, was actually drawn during the impeachment trial. It was going to be published once Johnson was impeached. And then when Johnson, Johnson survives impeachment, they wait and they don't publish it until after, uh, after the end of his term. Um, you know, portraying, obviously, Johnson as a, as a fallen Caesar. In the aftermath, you get quickly this portrayal, especially for a northern Republican audience, of how is it that there's going to be a portrayal of the, that's going to lead up to this notion of a bloody shirt. And what's interesting here is that in an effort to portray a sort of demonic um, white South, is that the impact that that's going to have upon the portrayal of African Americans and the shift to the sort of victim, even among sort of, you know, relatively in the context of the time, sympathetic Northern Republicans to the growth of this sort of victim idea, that the way that you show how bad the South is is by showing the sort of martyrdom of African Americans. Um, and this builds out of stuff that uh, Ed Blum is working on, on the actual literal portrayal of Southerners as devils during the war, very popular uh, envelopes that circulated. Um, and you can see how quickly this pushback, this recognition that there's a reconciliationist impulse, and how quickly and, and thoroughly there is a pushback against that, especially on Harper's catering to a largely uh, Republican audience. So let us clasp hands over the bloody chasm, and this is the bloody chasm, is Andersonville, right? On the other hand, the part two of it is let us clasp hands over the bloody chasm, and this is the bloody chasm, which is electoral murder, right? And the sequencing together of these two things, right? The massive, um, you know, the sort of starvation of northern uh, political prisoners at Andersonville and the assassination of southern African Americans. Um, and here you see again some of the sort of, you know, clarity, even crudity of the, uh, of the, of the images. Worse than slavery and the Klan clasping hands over the, uh, you know, over a skull. Um, and of how sharp um, and interested they were in this, in this notion of producing for the northern, northern consuming public this notion, Confederacy and the Klan are one and the same. You know, toward this idea that unifies the Republican Party of vote as you shop. Um, Frank Leslie's Illustrated, not surprisingly, provides you know, a different image of it against the, you know, against the bloody shirt, you know, sort of a different portrayal of African Americans. And also this thing that'll recur over and over of who's behind, you know, the Klan. That's Ulysses S. Grant, right? You know, it's all just this sort of mock-up, this, you know, this effort to gin up excitement in a way, um, rather than something that's an actual real thing, you know, this notion to portray, um, to deflate the Klan talk. Um, and this one, I think, is interesting just because it's uh, because of the pictorial notion of it, right? That if there's so many that are about accumulating body, 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 <laughs> that here's one that lets sort of one stand, uh, you know, one stand right in its place. The and then this is you know gathering dead and wounds in 1873. I'm going to skip over these. When you look into the 1876, I have weird ideas, which I'll come, you know, which I'll skip over. When you look at the production of the bloody shirt into the 1890s, 
you do see after the failure, especially of the, uh, of the, of the Lodge Bill, um, this shift in the portrayal of how Central African American suffering is to the need to show why exactly white Southerners are bad. Um, but you don't see a decline in it. 1892 you know, becomes, in some ways, the last campaign really fought over this, even though the Democrats, of course, as they do throughout, nominate to Northerners. But by re-bringing up, by, by up the substitution issue, you see this portrayal of this is the Democrats, this is the Republicans, right? Union, veterans versus substitutes. It's a three-part series, war records contrasted, Grover Cleveland saying fat and drinking, while his substitutes stagger off. Uh, Benjamin Harrison and the Republicans fighting to preserve, uh, preserve the Union. And then finally, one last one. Um, this image, you know, this constant, and in a way of reckoning back to the image of uh, Southern of, of Confederates as literal devils, um, an effort to, where they really place the head of Grover Cleveland atop a serpent as the copperhead, and back to the memorial of the sort of weeping, sad, uh, sad Union memorial. The thing I think that you know to me is interesting about this is how difficult, how sort of frustrating this is to an effort at coherence, even though. You know, Blight's book talks about the bloody shirt and he's deeply aware of it. There is an impulse, knowing where the, where the outcome is going to go, to turn northern public opinion into a consensual model. And instead, generally in politics, but especially at this moment where the, the militarization of politics and the, and the sort of transfer of that um, sense of loyalty and often organization into political parties, um, instead of why it's so difficult to sort of reckon with the notion, um, not of a consensual betrayal, but of a defeat. Right? That there is a party that upholds not what would be a sort of, uh, you know, that commands a majority of the North for much of this time, that upholds not what would, you know, that doesn't, that quickly jettisons the notions of absolute equality, but that does, you know, continue to run on the notion that white Southerners are almost literally the devil, um, that is able to string together victories despite getting um, virtually no votes in the South, uh, you know, very tight and, and winning virtually no Southern states. Um, and really, you know, when you look at what the Republican Party runs on up until 1896, it's that, the bloody shirt and the tariff, which nobody can understand, you know, then or now. <laughs> um, and I think it does suggest what it would do to some of our narratives if we imagine not as a sort of consensual betrayal, but as an actual defeat. Um, though, you know, against the Republicans, I will say that what they did to stay in power was to do things like divide up North Dakota and South Dakota to add electoral votes and to create this sort of dominance of the, of the Great Plains and the West of our politics the, that we're stuck with now in the electoral power. <laughs>